Hi, welcome to the Friends of the Library's virtual author events. Today, we're delighted to welcome Francesca Leo Block, the author of many, many books of fiction, poetry, and nonfiction. We also welcome Kevis Brownson, who will be our moder moderator tonight. I'm David Beal, and I'm here to give you a, a very brief introduction. I re represent the Friends of the Library in Alameda, California. We're an advocacy group that supports our outstanding public library through volunteerism and monetary support. Our donors have provided support for these webinars, as well as the many programs we su support at the library, such as adult literacy and uh, children and teens programs. We ask you that you consider a, a donation to, the, to our website, alamedafriends.com, or through the link in the chat feature of this event. Before we get started, uh, just some technical details. This is a webinar and it will be recorded and it will be available in a few days on our website. Your microphones are muted and cameras are turned off. We encourage you to use the chat feature to introduce yourself. Uh, it's nice to let others know in the audience where you're from. Also, the chat is a way for you to ask questions, which Kevis and Francesca will address in, in the latter part of the program. We, we do ask that you keep your um, questions and comments respectful. Uh, disrespectful comments could result in uh, you, your being dropped from the program. Anyway, on to our program. Kevis Brownson has been involved in our small city since 1983. She holds a degree in biology, but her favorite classes at Berkeley were not science, but the literature classes with their animated discussions about writing and, and its meanings. After college, she became involved in voluntary reading and literature programs, most recently by or originating and hosting the Alameda Authors Series until 2020 with the AAUW and the Friends of the Library. She's now retired and we are happy that she has more time to devote to books and art and to help us out with our discussions. So, uh, hello Kevis, how are you this evening? Hi, I'm great. I am happy to introduce our author tonight who's written more than 25 books of fiction, nonfiction, short stories and poetry. She received the Spectrum Award, the Phoenix Award, the ALA Rainbow Award, and the Margaret A. Edwards Lifetime Achievement Award, as well as other citations from the American Library Association and from the New York Times Book Review, School Library Journal, and Publishers Weekly. She teaches writing, and as a visiting assistant professor in creative writing at the University of Redlands, she was a finalist for Professor of the Year Award. Let's welcome Francesca Leah Block. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate being here. Um, I, I guess I'm gonna start by reading a little excerpt, if that's okay. Um, this is from my new novel called House of Hearts. And it's uh, in the first chapter, but it's not the very beginning. While they were at work on the garden last week, a bell chimed and a little red-haired girl came riding up on a pink bicycle. Mylar streamers tied to the handlebars. A white basket entwined with fake pink flowers. She paused watching the four people planting the garden and Izzy got up wiping her hands on her jeans. The streamers gleamed like water or a desert mirage. Hi there mama, Izzy said. The girl was close to the age of the child Izzy and Cyrus would have had if she hadn't miscarried. And even though that was a long time ago, this thought still stung. How are you today? The girl squinted. Grime smeared her already old looking face. She'd bitten off her nails. Izzy remembered how she'd bitten her own nails as a child, bitten her nails down to the quick. Maybe as a way to let people know things weren't okay at home. But no one seemed to notice that things weren't okay. 
or at least no one seemed to care. What are you doing? The girl asked. We're tending the garden, Izzy said. The child took it all in, the wooden beds, the damp patch of earth, the seedlings, the four strangers. Two women, both with long black hair, one curvy, one thin. Two men, one dark, one fair and burned. Flowers, the girl asked, will, will there be flowers? Next spring, beans flower, so do pumpkins. She seemed to find this satisfactory and began riding her bike in circles in the dust. Hartebeest, monk seal, great auk, ibex, javan, tiger. She said in what Izzy heard as an almost iambic sing-song. What's that? Izzy asked. Passenger pigeon, Pyrenean ibex, quagga, sea mink, Tasmanian tiger, tacopa pupfish, West African black rhino. What was she talking about? Izzy wondered. I don't. African elephant, Asian elephant, bald eagle, giant panda, orangutan, polar bear, rhinoceros. The girl stopped riding. Okay, extinct or endangered. Izzy wanted to cover her ears. Instead, she knelt down. That's sad about those animals, huh? The girl peered up through red eyelashes, almost transparent in the sun, her eyes starting to water. Not tears exactly. Izzy's eyes used to water like that when her father Larry told her ghost stories to scare her. The little girl swiped a hand across her face and the dirt there smeared. We are all sharing the earth's pain. Her voice had a slightly robotic tone as if she were repeating something she'd been told. Izzy shivered with that kind of cold that comes from within and a shade lowered down behind her eyes. That was the only way she could describe it. Her vision didn't darken, only her mind. The first darkness had come when she was a kid while she slept on the scratchy trailer cot, not knowing that her new black kitten writhed and mewled on the clothesline, its sound sucked away by a succubus wind. What'd you say, honey? Izzy asked. The girl set her gaze on Cyrus then. We will stand around the glass box and cry and our tears will turn into flowers, she said. She turned and pedaled away across the road toward a house painted a salt corroded blue sky blue with a rough hewn windmill fastened to the front. The windmill didn't move in the hot still air. Did it ever move? Stopping her bicycle in the weeds that grew in front of the house, the child got off the bike and ran inside. Watching her go, Izzy had the distinct and unnerving feeling that somehow, impossibly, this was the child she and Cyrus had lost. The child that had been only blood. Oh, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. I want to remind our audience that um, Please go ahead and put your questions in the chat as we go along. While you think of them, there'll be a Q and A um, later on in the end. So, so Francesca, your characters are so vivid. Do the characters yeah. come into your head first, or the story first? Um, in the case of this story, the character did. Um, I had written another novel, uh, which kind of a tragic ending, and I had kind of almost a vision of another character coming to redeem the character in the other book, um, that she became the character in this book. So sometimes the character will start the story, probably most of the time. Sometimes it will be a setting as well. Right, do you know what the, where the story is going? I mean, especially in this case where the character started when you started or? I, I usually have a general sense, but uh, I really discover the plot as I go along. I, I used to do that more frequently when I started my career where I would kind of get lost in the forest, I like to call it, of the story, or in this case, the desert of the story. Um, but as time went on and I had to write a little bit more quickly and I was teaching, I began to come up with some structural 
outline kind of guides for myself. So sometimes I'll do a bit of that in the beginning, but I do like to get a little lost and let my subconscious take over, at least in the first draft. Right. Have you always thought of yourself as a writer? Yes, uh, I, I had, was lucky to have the encouragement of my parents. So I think when I was tiny, as soon as I could write, I was writing poetry um, and my parents were considering it poetry. <laughs> so I was, I was very, very fortunate. And I always knew I wanted to do that and uh, pursued it in school and just kind of kept going. But I don't know if, if I would have in the same way if I hadn't had that kind of encouragement. So I try as a teacher to be that person for students who didn't have it and yet kind of always felt inside. I hear this often, you know, I know that I am a writer, but I don't trust it. And I, I didn't have the support. So I try to always encourage that because everyone has a story to tell really. And if you want to tell it, you can learn the tools and tell it, you know, I believe. So that kind of brings us to what, elements what other elements do you bring to your classes and students i see you teach quite a bit i do i so i teach uh well i've been teaching for quite a long time and over time i developed some systems because i began by doing it very intuitively just the way i wrote and some students wanted something more concrete so i came up with these 12 questions that i use as a guide they're in my uh, memoir the thorn necklace but, and then I also went back to school recently and studied screenwriting. So sometimes I will uh, suggest general structure based loosely on screenplays. However, I only recommend that when the student has a, a draft usually, unless they're a more advanced student, because I don't want a, it to become formulaic or restricting. And then I'll do all kinds of seminars on literature that I love. And, uh, and of course, encourage a lot of reading as part of the, the teaching in addition to that. So, so aside from helping your students, um, were there any other reasons that you decided to write a book about writing? Uh, I, you know, I think that I, a lot of people encouraged me to do that. I, I was sort of at a crossroads in my career. I wasn't sure what to do next. And about four really smart people said to me, you should write uh, some kind of craft book slash memoir. And I found a way to combine the two elements. But I think it was really in response to people asking for it, which isn't usually the way I work. Uh, I, I did learn a lot through the process of writing the memoir part, but I found the memoir part to be really um, challenging because I mostly do write fiction and you are vulnerable in a different way. That's interesting. I mean, it's really who I am in that, in that book. Um, and I, I think the impetus to, to do it in order to, as you say, to kind of help other people with their writing felt like the right step in my career at that time and, and currently, because as I'm seeing how the world change is changing, I really want to amplify other voices and use what I've learned to kind of encourage that. So that was part of it as well. Well, I found that when I was going through that book a little bit, that I think it spoke to other creative processes as well, very much. And how do you think writers fit in in the realm of art in general with music and visual art and performance art and dance and so on? Where, where's, where's, the, where's the connection and the contrast with the other parts of art? Well, I know for myself, my dad was a painter, my mom was a poet, played music, danced. So that was, all of it was very much a part of my upbringing. And I get so much inspiration from the visual arts and um, all, all art. So I think that it's, there's this creative impulse that we all, or that many of us feel um, activated. And I think whatever way you express it, of course, is unique, but there's a there's a an essence to it that that's related. So, I I hope that that book can be helpful for people who are 
working in other art forms. That would be a, a real honor for me to see that. Great. So um, although you've had so many books published and been a, a successful writer for many, many years, you entered a degree program for writing. And why did you do that? So a few years ago, I was teaching in an MFA program and I wanted to, you know, part-time and I wanted to perhaps get other work as well in, you know, I, um, I was working a lot privately and at an extension, UCLA extension, but I wanted to have maybe other opportunities. So I thought it would be good for me to go back to school for that reason to get an MFA, which I had never done. Uh, and I went back for that, but then I got so many other things out of it. I, I got this book that I just read from, and I was so excited to explore the books that I had loved when I was younger and look at them in a critical way with this new perspective of age. And I really found that uh, I was even more inspired and my teachers were wonderful. It was a bit of an adjustment to, to do it at this age because I'm definitely was one of the oldest students and older than all my teachers actually, but, but um, it was really a, a good thing. And it, and it did help me feel even more empathy for students going through the workshop process because you know, I know to be nurturing and I know that it's vulnerable, but now I really know because <laughs> I hadn't done it since I was in my, you know, 20, since I was 20. Right. I, I know it's hard for me to think about going back to school at some point in my life later than being 19 or 20, you know. Yeah, so different, kind of but in a way, great, you know. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's, that's wonderful. So, I know that, well, for me, I, I get a little bit annoyed because music, for example, has been divided into so many different little genres and classifications. And I'm just wondering how the labeling of different kinds of writing, how does that affect you? Has it been a help or a hindrance? And how, how do you deal with that? <laughs> So it has affected me a lot. Um, I was really fortunate to be published quite young by a wonderful publisher who gave me a lot of freedom and encouraged me to do more books. Uh, and so that was great. But it was in a genre that I had not intended, which is the in books for younger readers, for young adult readers. Um, so I've also published a bunch of adult books, including, of course, you know, the upcoming one that I read from but and memoir but um i because i had this wonderful relationship with the publisher and the publisher was selling them many of my books to a younger audience i did get that label and it became frustrating many my readers now are mostly 30 and up mostly in their 30s and 40s i think but um i you know still feel i have to explain to people that my books were never really intended for much younger, uh, although I'm grateful because some very young readers got their hands on them and said they were really helpful to them during difficult times in their lives. So I'm extremely honored that I had that opportunity to, to do that. Wonderful. So um, I know another label is magic realism and um, you use elements of magic in your in your novels, um, but it's quite it, it's a bit different than say Isabella Allende or Gabriel Gar Garcia Marquez. Can you can you explain and talk about the use of magic? In your well, books? I mean, she's uh, Isabella Allende. House of the Spirits is like m one of my top five books. I always say, and actually, I'm just writing a. Uh, presentation on on it on uh, magical the magical feminine um, magical realism so I I was very much influenced by that uh, I I started writing through the lens of Southern California or California fiction so and kind of this my background in the early punk scene in LA and pop culture so some of that mixed in to the magical realism 
but uh, I, I really try to use those elements of the world that it, a real world where there are strange things that happen and yet it's not fantasy. And then I also like to play with language so that the language is so concrete and specific that the magic feels real, but the mad, uh, language is also lyrical and full of metaphor so that the real feels magical. So that's, those are kind of things I aspire to with it that I think um, I was influenced by reading those authors you mentioned early on. Yeah, well, I, I noticed in the elementals that some of those elements that you just mentioned of that it, it's the, the world seems very concrete and real, but also the magic does too. Yeah, so, it's, yeah. thank you. It's an interesting balance to find. Yeah, so um, do you think that writing can be a healing force? So it has always been for me, uh, it was, I. I feel like through very difficult losses that I experienced, it helped me survive really. And uh, I'm very interested in the way that telling our stories actually does create a, a sense of, of peace and connection and release. And uh, so I, I believe that very strongly. I recently actually, went through a period where I was for the first time in my life, I didn't feel that way, which is interesting because I am always the person saying to, to my students and my friends, you know, it's even though my life is very challenging for me and daily basis, writing was always very comforting and trying to help them find that. And then I was at a different place. So it's been interesting to kind of look at it in a new way and, and get my, get back to that. Now, I think it had to do with being, you know, going through the MFA program, writing this book that meant so much to me, not selling it right away, being very drained kind of from the whole experience. And then, you know, now kind of coming back to the original love I had for it, which is just as a way to express myself, uh, entertain myself, frankly, and, connect to other people. I see. Um, when you talk about yourself as a California writer, that's the, there's some obvious elements to that in terms of scenes in place, but how do you see a California writer seeing the world as opposed to say someone writing from New York or from Louisiana or from the Midwest? That's a great question. I haven't thought a lot about it, so I'm not, I'm not sure how to answer it. I think um, there, well, I, yes, I do have one thing to say about that. So my, my father was from Brooklyn. He was a painter in New York. Uh, he wanted to leave New York. This was in the 50s, um, 40s, actually, um, to come to Los Angeles because he felt there was less weight of tradition and more freedom to reinvent. So he, and just the light alone, I think, was incredibly inspire, inspiring to him as a painter. So that that uh, is a big part of it. I came of age writing these books when I was very young, but I was away from the hot New York literary scene. You know, I was sort of sheltered in Los Angeles, enjoying my life here. And so, and it, or at Berkeley, you know, and, and so there was something uh, kind of freeing, I guess, and you could maybe experiment and have less of that pressure. That might be the, the one aspect at least I'd have to think more but I think that's that was part of it I didn't have, didn't quite feel the same pressure I think I would have if I had been back east in my 20s um, publishing at that time wonderful so that um excerpt that you read from your new book was so so great and I'd love to hear another excerpt Oh, thank yeah. you. Okay, this is, well, speaking of Los Angeles um, or California, this is 
well, this is specifically Los Angeles. One second, I'm just gonna, okay. So this is a flashback to the character uh, visiting Los Angeles. Most of the book takes place in the Salton Sea area, the part that I read earlier. They wound past facades that bloomed serenely out of the night like the pale magnolia blossoms on the dark trees. Spanish adobes, Italianate villas, French Normandy style palaces, Tudor farmhouses, colonial and neoclassical mansions. Stone walls covered with sleeping beauty roses. Hedges revealing glimpses of Cinderella fountained courtyards with sweeping stairs, small white lights in topiary bushes. A Hansel and Gretel cottage with turrets, gables, spun sugar windows. Izzy and Cyrus read a book about Los Angeles that explained how it was built on sacred burial grounds, earthquake faults, quartz mines, swamp lands, and prehistoric tar pits filled with the bones of saber-toothed tigers. Even the streets were named for tar, La Brea, and swamp lands, marshes, La Cienega. LA, the land of devils, <clears throat> Larry liked to say, sucking on smoke. Don't move there without me, okay? Izzy hummed it with pleasure now, not really afraid Cyrus ever would, although perhaps part of her was afraid. Cyrus took her chin in his hand like he might hold one of the china molds from which she made her chocolates and candles and looked into her eyes again. There is nothing to leave, he said. You are me and I am you. Love don't die. Oh, yes. So I think um, in one of your books, maybe two of them, there was something about one of your professors uh, said, oh, too many adjectives. I'm paraphrasing. Too many no, adjectives. No. Use nouns. Use nouns for description. Can you talk about that a little bit? The reason I'm laughing is now I'm looking at the excerpts going, oh, I did it. I still did it, you know, all these years later. <laughs> I love adjectives. Um, I enjoy them. I enjoy writing them. But when I'm looking at student work, I always encourage concrete nouns so that the reader can really be engaged in it and imagine it themselves. I think that happens more powerfully with the, the concrete noun. And then back to that magical realism, I think those nouns really ground us in, in the world. Uh, also sensory detail and they're so they're very powerful uh so I try but I do stray into my love of adjectives and I was heartened because just today uh, I to do that presentation on magical realism I was looking at Isabella Ende and I was looking at a long long sentence full of adjectives and I was so thrilled to find it so but she can do anything she wants but you know <laughs> she's Isabel. But, you know, I do, I do think nouns and nouns can be very grounding for the writing and, and keep it very crisp too. Yeah. Um, oh, I just had a question in it. <laughs> it's just like, I got so engaged in what you were saying and I, but, but it's true. What your writing is, is so vivid. It's, it's really, um, uh, I love your characters, and um, but now I remember to my question. Yes. So, um, when you are dealing with characters, they're they have names, and and I'm just curious where where you come up with the names. Do they have <laughs> names when they appear in your head, or do they do you spend some time thinking about what is the best name? I usually. I have kind of wacky names in a lot of my books. Um, I usually let the name that just comes to me start me off. Um, and then I'll have a strong sense if it's not working. I had one book that just wasn't working at all and I changed her name and it, it, it helped so much. I believe in the power of names, sort of fight, like in the fairy tale, kind of finding the, the true name in order to unlock the secret. So I, I do think there's something to that. And, you know, I use all the traditional 
methods. I look at baby names. I look up, you know, meanings of maybe mythological names. Uh, I try to try to relate it to that. Sometimes it's just instinct, but I do like to be playful with names and I find it uh, makes the writing more fun when I, when I do that. Yeah. I, I noticed there were some sort of uh, fun names in the elementals, but yeah, I had fun with that. Um, <laughs> no, I usually, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I think this is, this has been great. Um, I would like to go ahead and get some audience questions now and uh, turn it over to David to go ahead and uh, ask some of the audience questions. Thank you so much, Kevin. Thank you. Well, let's check some of these questions out here. Uh, actually, the, the first one here is from me, <laughs> which was, uh, who are some of the... Uh, Authors uh, that have inspired you. What what author? What other authors? You mentioned Isabel Allende, but uh, yes, else? yes. So um, so when I went back to school, I started making my reading list of books I loved, and I did not realize until I had put them all together that a lot of them were considered Gothic literature. So the Bronte sisters. Um, Shirley Jackson as a more contemporary and even writers like Toni Morrison are kind of working in like in Beloved in that genre to a degree. So there's kind of um, a, a dark element to a lot of them, but also very kind of poetically written. Um, so that's one thing. And then, I mean, there are just so many that whenever I get this question, I completely <laughs> blank mm -hmm. out. Okay. But I would say magical realist authors, gothic literature, um, kind of wide variety of female authors um, try, trying to kind of read inclusively. I love Zora Neale Hurston. Um, I, I think yeah, gosh, I have a, I need to look at a list <laughs> because there's just so many. But, you know, um, I, I do read a lot of female authors. I'm trying to read a lot more contemporary uh, authors right now. Uh, I just read, uh, let's see, our My Year of Rest and Relaxation by mm -hmm. Otessa Mafoye. And I read Bunny by Mona Awad. Uh, I liked both of those a lot. But, you know, I could spend the whole night telling you mm -hmm. <laughs> When you mentioned uh, magical realism, I thought of the book that always comes to mind for me is um, Like Water for Chocolate. Oh, uh, that's Laura great. Laura Esquivel, you know. Oh, it's you know. so beautiful. Yeah, I love yeah. that book. Yeah. yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, another question here. Excuse me if I do this. I'm very nearsighted and I have to get close oh. to the screen here. Uh, is, is, uh, uh, a listener asks, can you talk about writing fiction versus nonfiction? Would you coach a nonfiction writer differently than fiction? Oh, great question. Oh, two, yeah. Before I forget, I just want to also add this um, Southern Gothic writers, Flannery O'Connor. Oh, yeah. My, you know, Catherine Ann Porter, Carson McCullers, big <laughs> favorite, love them. Okay, I just had to say that. Um, so right. difference between with fiction and nonfiction. So I usually encourage my fiction writers to work as much from their personal lives um, as they are comfortable doing, because I think that best material usually comes from this very personal place. So I think that nonfiction writers are really exciting to work with because they're already doing that. They're already being vulnerable and exposing themselves in that way. So I usually... I'm less concerned with structure from the beginning with nonfiction. Although I would say with fiction as well, I try to let people just kind of free write for a while. But as in my experience with writing my own memoir, I really had to just write down memories without trying to figure out exactly what my thesis was. And it was a, it, that developed later. So I might be less um, inclined to impose structure. I do like the art of memoir for, for um, that by Mary Carr for writing nonfiction. And I usually use that book. Hmm. Uh, and I, when someone is fairly far along in their memoir, I might start using some of the 
questions and structure that I do suggest for fiction, but I try to wait until really they, they know what they're going to be writing about because it's obviously memoir is not autobiography. So you need that portion of your life when something momentous happened. And you also need some kind of message to the reader regarding how is this going to help them by hearing this story. So it's, it's a bit different than when you're writing fiction, I think, in that way. I hope that answered it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. I think so. Uh, someone here said uh, that they had a writing professor who accused them of actually using too many adverbs, <laughs> not too many nouns. That <laughs> is, I, I would say that um, adverbs are a, a pet peeve of mine. I will definitely circle the LYs. Uh, yeah. I do oh, yeah. think that... Uh, Sometimes a really unique, um, like Shirley Jackson, for example, uses them so well. Sometimes great writers use them well, but generally they, they tell rather than show and an active verb is a lot stronger. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, right, yeah. Uh, do you have the experience of your characters talking to you, says someone? I do. Um, I. I love it when they do, when they don't is when it's the problem. <laughs> but I'll usually just set them up in a scene, knowing that there needs to be some conflict and kind of allow them to talk and let the dialogue, you know, reveal whatever they want to say. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, there are times when that isn't happening and then you have to kind of push it. I also feel that I watch the story unfold and I'm kind of recording what I'm seeing in a, almost as in a movie as a movie mm. in my brain mm. but I used to say that but then I realized that there were pieces of that that I wasn't necessarily seeing so I used an exercise that a colleague of mine Jim Crusoe who's a really wonderful writer used to describe five different use five sentences to describe what you see in the scene and when you do per paragraph and when you do that you realize that you are you are missing certain things that you think you see and you kind of have to create them as you go so it's kind of a cool way to add that another layer to that but yes I do see them I do hear them but then there is that extra step of like really refining it so that the reader sees and hears them Okay, here's a kind of a long one here. Um, uh, this person is, was late and apologizes if she missed uh, this in the beginning, but um, she's curious about the nitty gritty of your writing process. Do you use outlines? Do you have a beginning, middle, and end be in mind before you start? Or does, it, anyway, I'll, I'll read the rest of the question after. Yeah. Yeah, I can see it too here. Um, so yeah. I I did talk a little bit in the beginning, but it, I'm, I'm more than happy to discuss this again. It, it's my initial process was just to write freely and see what came of it. And then as I went along in my career and had to produce books more quickly and to teach writing, I started to uh, study it and figure out certain elements that I have in place as a general outline. And that's the 12 questions that I talked about that I use in the Thorn necklace and that I used to teach with. So now I generally have some sense and I have exercises that I give my class based on the arc of the character that help me determine where the story will end. I also met a Pulitzer prize winning uh, playwright once who said that he, I asked him, cause I've never written plays, you know, hmm. where do you start? And he said, I see an image on the stage in my mind, like a vision of the final moment on the stage. And I write towards that. So I, cause I see here, you say, I feel like not knowing how something will end often stops me from even starting to write. So I don't think you have to know exactly how it ends, but if you can use some of these questions to determine the arc of the character, how they change, and I won't get into too much detail, but it's basically from a flaw to a need that is going to give you a general sense of a series of conflicts that lead from the beginning of the story to the resolution where the character learns something and changes. Wow. Okay. I almost uh, went into my whole 12 questions lecture, but I stopped myself. So <laughs> we wouldn't have time. Okay. Well, good. 
Uh, let's. I'm, I'm going to give people one more chance. I'm, I'm going to ask Kevis if she has anything else to ask, or I think her mic is off. But, oh, there it's on. Anything I, else, Kevis? Yeah. Um, I I just wanted to say how how much I um, I enjoyed uh, your very different novels that um, I read. The the we see that was just enchanting. I'm still I still love that yeah. so much. And the elementals, what a great story! I'm just I'm just thrilled. Thank so you. you know to be able to read that and to be introduced to your work. Um, through this, uh, the friends and uh, and our life is so enriched by the writers all around us, and and I'm I feel very blessed to have have made your acquaintance in person. Um, oh, thank, so thank you. I I did want to ask you though, yes. um, your new book. Um, what is the status? Is that coming out soon or? Um, so I can't officially report, but we're in the process of doing the contract. So it should be, I'm thinking about a year from now, which is actually, believe it or not, pretty quick, um, considering the pace of publishing sometimes. So I'm, I'm doing that. And then um, I have some stories that just came out on Audible uh, originals that are available. And I am waiting the very long process of developing one of Weetzy into television. I have um, the Game of Thrones producers are attached to it, but you know, that whole world of Hollywood is so slow and complex. And I've been, you know, developing it for 30 years with different people, frankly. So I'm not, too, I'm not holding my breath, but it's kind of a fun thing to imagine in the future. And in the meantime, I'm going to do what I, can you know have much more control of, over which is is writing books because and teaching which is really fun and I I think somebody asked a question about writing did I see something about how writing teaching changed my writing has teaching writing changed the way you write um, so I think that that is very much the case I think that as I uh, break it down and understand it better, hopefully, to, to help my students, hopefully I'm helping my own writing as well. So. Well, I'm not going to ask you who you might hope would play Weetzy Bat or Dirk, but um, because I know that kind of jinxes it, right? You don't want to do that. <laughs> well, um, but, I've jinxed yeah. it about a hundred times in the last 30 years, so, <laughs> but it's okay. I mean, the actresses just keep changing. You know, I have a huge list, but we'll see. Yeah. I'm sure some unknown will, you know, or someone that is unknown now. <laughs> will be right. Perfect. No, we'll we'll be watching for it because it'll it'll make a wonderful um, uh, on screen uh, movie yeah. or series, whatever it turns out to be. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I guess that the. Uh seems to more or less wrap it up here or, or anything else that anybody wants to say <laughs> please feel free I... to you know oh sorry david uh, oh how, a website you have a website too so that people can go to and see what's going on with you right and yes. maybe a blog yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, francescaliablock.com. Uh, and I have a lot of my class offerings, my books. And if you have other questions that you don't feel like asking right now, although I'm an open book, no pun intended. So um, <laughs> please feel free to either, you know, now or, or certainly um, through my website, because I, I like to support the creative process in whatever way I can or just answer questions you might have. Well, thank you so much. It's been so great to, to have you come talk to us. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, th thank you, Kevis and, um, and Francesca both. Uh, it was a really uh, in informative and uh, fun talk. So uh, folks, I want to remind you of a few upcoming programs that we have. On June 9th at 7, 
we'll have the activist, author, speaker, and award winner, George Takei. He'll be talking about his graphic novel, They Called Us Enemy. It's about his childhood experiences in, world, in a World War II internment camp. Those of you who are Star Trek fans know who George, George is. For those who aren't, he was Mr. Sulu, the helmsman on, of the Starship Enterprise. Then on June 22nd, we will have one of our favorite docents, Averill Angevin, discussing the iconic work of the Dis Depression era photographer, Dorothea Lang. We, and we hope you can uh, join us for those events. Before we go, folks, I want to remind you again that we depend on donations to put on these programs and also to support our uh, wonderful library. We have a link in the chat to make it easier for you to do that. Our goal is to see that the library can, quote, live long and prosper, as someone with a Starfleet communicator pen might say. So that's our story. I want to thank our behind, behind the scenes helpers, Karen Romer and Karen Manuel, who are instrumental in producing these events. Also, Becky Sear and Billy Reinsmith, who help uh, with the website and recordings. And of course, thanks again to Francesca and Kevis for a delightful presentation. Finally, uh, you, I thank you, the audience, who make these events enjoyable. So have a good evening, and we'll see you the next time. <laughs>